Hi there. Thank you for joining the National Lupus and You event hosted by the Lupus Foundation of America. My name is Ashley Holden, and I'll be the host for tonight's program. Our topic is hair loss, skin rashes, and self-image. This is a great topic to kick off the month since November is National Healthy Skin Month. Here's a brief overview of our program. As you can see, we have a full agenda. I'll kick us off by sharing more about the Lupus Foundation of America and some helpful resources and ways you can get involved. And of course, we are so excited and honored to have tonight's speakers, and I cannot wait to hear their presentations. Before we begin, we'd like to extend a thank you to our sponsor for tonight's program, AstraZeneca. Thank you, Ashley. My name is Jamie Gray, and I'm the Associate Director of Advocacy and Alliance. Oh, oh, sorry, Jamie. Um, can we have a, a dedicated slide for you in just a little bit? I'm going to get through just a couple more items, and then I can introduce you. I apologize. So before we begin, I, I do apologize about that little mishap, um, but I just wanted to go over a couple of things before we jump in. So if you have a general question for our speakers, you can submit it at any time through the Q&A feature. You'll want to click on the Q&A button. Um, it should be clicked at the bottom. There should be other um, options down there. And you can type in your question for our speakers. If you prefer to remain anonymous, there should also be an option to do that as well. And the, um, we will have time at the end that we have allotted where our speakers will answer those questions. We will try to answer all as many questions as we can. Unfortunately, we typically run out of time. So if you have a question that we don't get to or a question that's more specific to your, um, your personal situation, you can reach out to our health education specialist. You can visit lupus.org slash health educator. Throughout the program, we will have polls that you can respond to, and you can also connect with each other via the chat. And I've seen a lot of people saying hi already this evening, which is wonderful. I also want to share a brief reminder that the nature of today's topic may lend itself to products and product recommendations. We encourage you to consult with your doctor before making any changes to your current regimen, including the use of any over-the-counter products. And finally, as a reminder, this program will be recorded. You'll receive a link of the recording along with helpful resources and a post-event survey where you can submit feedback for tonight's program. So we have our first poll and give us a second to get this up. Sometimes this takes us a second. There we go. So our first poll question is, are you or a loved one dealing with any of the following? And you can check all that apply. We have cutaneous lupus, systemic lupus with skin manifestation, hair loss, and other. I still see results coming in, so I'll give us a few more seconds when that slows down. All right, take our final couple of seconds. Looks like we've slowed down here. Oh, they're still coming. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and take a look at those results. So it looks about 14% are dealing with cutaneous lupus, 67% with systemic lupus with skin manifestations. 76% with hair loss and 22% with other. Thanks for participating in that poll. Okay. So if you're not familiar with the Lupus Foundation of America, I wanted to share our vision and our mission. So to put these simply, our goal is to one day end the impact of lupus and its suffering while ensuring that we provide the comprehensive support and programs people with lupus need today. 
Here at the Lupus Foundation of America, we work to meet the diverse needs of all people with lupus, and our commitment has never wavered in our over more than 40 years of service. Today, people with lupus are living longer, healthier lives than ever before, and the Lupus Foundation of America has played a significant role, a significant role in that achievement. We remain committed to doing everything we can to help you navigate the complexities of lupus while rallying every possible resource to end it forever. And to do that, we have three different pillars, which our programs are based upon, and they include research, care and support services for people affected by lupus, and advocacy. We've redefined lupus to expand our efforts beyond just funding research grants. We're engaging all stakeholders to identify barriers that stand in the way of progress and setting course to overcome them. And we do this while providing caring support for people affected by this devastating disease and leading advocacy efforts to bring more funding for research and services. We have a disease specific and patient centric strategic outcomes. And so this, our approach is really comprehensive and focused on achieving meaningful results that will make a difference in the lives of people affected by lupus. We align efforts and resources toward achieving four specific outcomes that are both, as I mentioned, disease specific and patient centric. So these include improving early diagnosis of lupus by increasing awareness of symptoms and educating health professionals so people with lupus get prompt care and treatment. We know how important that is. Securing new, safe, effective, and tolerable treatments for lupus by advancing research, improving how new treatments are evaluated and educating people about clinical trials, expanding direct services and increasing access to treatments and care by providing resources and advocating for improved health services and affordable medicines. And finally, raising and securing government funding to operate programs that help people affected by lupus. In the interest of time, I'll keep this brief, but I wanted to share about some of our programs and resources available to you. So first, I wanted to share that we have a network of over 100 support groups that provide a safe and understanding environment where people with lupus can come together and ask questions, listen to others, or lend a helping hand. To learn more about our support groups, including some of our um, more specific population support groups that we have, visit lupus.org slash local support. I also want to highlight SELF, which stands for Strategies to Embrace Living with Lupus Fearlessly. And SELF is our free online self-management program designed to help people with lupus live their best life. It can be a virtual coach, if you will, to help you manage lupus symptoms, manage stress, manage medications, and work better with your healthcare team. It's convenient and customized to your needs. It offers easy to use tools, trackers, information, support, and reminders. We also recently launched a self recently launched Self as a mobile app to add to the convenience. And it's available both in the Google and Apple stores. There are many ways you can get involved with the Lupus Foundation of America. Again, here are just a few in the essence of time. One, we have Make Your Mark. That's our community fundraising program. It's a way to turn an event into a fundraiser for lupus. You can use your passion to raise funds for lupus through an in-person or virtual event. Team Make Your Mark is our endurance program where anyone from a, a beginner to an experienced athlete can turn their next run, jog, bike, or swim into a way to raise funds and help end lupus. And finally, your voice as an advocate is one of the most powerful tools we have. We are the leader in stimulating federal support for lupus. Every day we fight to ensure the government is responsible, responsive to the many Americans living with lupus. You can sign up to be a lupus advocate on our website as well. We have our next poll question. Our second poll question is, does your lupus impact your appearance or your loved one's appearance? And the options are yes, no, sometimes I'm not sure. 
And again, I'll give us a couple of seconds to answer that and we'll look at the results once I see the responses slow down. Okay, looks like they're slowing down. I'll give you a couple more seconds. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at those results. So 58% say yes, 10% say no, 30% say sometimes, and 2% are not sure. So that's great information for our speakers to, to be aware of as we go through tonight's information. Uh, presentations. Okay, so I apologize about the, the confusion we had before, but first I want to say that we do have a special message from our sponsor, AstraZeneca. Jamie Gray is the Associate Director of Respiratory and Immunology Advocacy and Alliance at AstraZeneca, and with a 20-year tenure at AstraZeneca, Jamie's experience spans the areas of research, development, operations, medical, and corporate affairs, and her passion for patients is what has driven her work throughout. Thank you so much for joining us, Jamie. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. I just wanted to say that I'm so gracious and excited for the opportunity to participate in today's webinar, and I want to thank Lupus Foundation of America for their partnership in pulling this webinar together. At AstraZeneca, we won't stop until we deliver clinical remission for patients with conditions like lupus, who have historically haven't achieved it or believed it to even be possible. We will continue to push the boundaries of science by targeting underlying disease drivers with new modalities and applying a precision medicine approach from the start of discovering medicines. We hope to, to reach a cure. It's back to you, Ashley. Thanks so much, Jamie. Yes, yeah, so a cure would be absolutely wonderful. I know so many people joining us tonight would feel the same way about that. Thank you again. Next, we have um, Dr. Victoria Worth, and I'll go ahead and give you a bit of a background about her and give her a warm welcome. So Victoria Worth is the professor of dermatology and medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. She is the chief of the division of dermatology at the Philadelphia Veterans Administration Hospital, Pennsylvania as well. Dr. Worth earned her medical degree from Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine in Baltimore, Maryland. She completed a residency in internal medicine at Northwestern Memorial Hospital in Chicago, Illinois and a dermatology residency and immunodermatology fellowship at New York University School of Medicine. She joined the faculty at the University of Pennsylvania in 1989 and has developed an internationally recognized program in autoimmune skin diseases. She is a co-founder in the Rheumatologic Dermatology Society and a past president of the group. She is the co-founder of the Medical Dermatology Society and a recipient of their Lifetime Achievement Award. She initiated the Combined Internal Medicine Dermatology Residency Program in the USA, which has successfully trained prominent leaders in complex medical dermatology. She serves on the Medical Advisory Board for the Lupus Foundation of America. She has a long standing interest in clinical and translational research pertaining to cutaneous lupus, with a focus on improving the treatment and outcomes. She has developed and validated disease severity tools now used in many international trials in lupus with a goal to advance goal to advancing evidence for current and new therapeutic targeting therapeutics targeting these diseases, excuse me. Her laboratory studies include studies of the mechanisms of cutaneous lupus, biomarker studies in cutaneous lupus, examining the heterogeneity genetity of the disease that relate to pathogenesis and ultraviolet light effects on the skin. Her work has been funded through the Dermatology Foundation, NIH, the VA, the DOD, and numerous autoimmune dis disease foundations and in the industry. And we are quite honored to have her join us. And as you can see, um, she has quite the resume and is the person that has 
much knowledge to talk about this topic. So welcome, Dr. Worth, and thank you for joining us. And thank you very much for having me. Uh, and obviously talking about uh, rashes and skin of lupus patients is something that uh, is really important. Uh, and so I'm really um, delighted to be able to talk about this. Um, and so uh, let me just say that I am an internist and dermatologist, and I think that of skin is really, uh, dermatology is really a subspecialty of internal medicine, and it really requires knowing more uh, than just skin, I think, to manage and properly diagnose and treat patients. So um, what I would like to do is I do have want to mention I have conflicts, and I did not have a slide like this many, uh, you know, probably a decade ago, there was nothing on this slide. And that's because people are really making a big effort to develop new treatments for lupus, and we certainly need them. Part of that is we've never had a drug um, that was approved just for um, cutaneous lupus. And uh, and so it's really time to really have a focus on that and talk about that. I think there's some good news that there is at least uh, one drug approved recently that seems to be uh, helpful in skin. And so we hope to um, be able to capitalize on that and improve the way that we can treat um, patients. So it is important to know that you can have uh, either um, skin lupus or systemic lupus or hybrid. And I think a lot of people have chronic cutaneous lupus and there's another group that have more SLE, but many people are somewhere in the middle, have some joint pain, maybe have some cytopenias. But when we're talking about the skin, we talk basically about several different types of skin lupus. And this gets very confusing for the doctors because you know, cutaneous lupus is not that common. And then on top of that, we have all these different sort of subtypes here. So discoid lupus, which can be either above, above the neck or above and below the neck when generalized or a little bit thicker in the way it looks. And I'll show you some pictures. And then it can be in the fat or it can be more uh, what we call tumid lupus, which looks a little different under the microscope. Um, and so that's only, um, we've only gotten to chronic cutaneous lupus. And then there's subacute cutaneous lupus where it doesn't scar to the same extent that chronic cutaneous can but it can still be a problem and it look a little bit like psoriasis. Sometimes it looks a little bit like ringworm. And, um, and so this can be very photosensitive and actually worth knowing that in, in people who get this or tend to be a little bit older and about a third of the time, their medications that actually are triggering it. So if, if, uh, if you have subacute cutaneous lupus, it's important to make sure that there's not a drug such as a, a proton pump inhibitor that you're maybe taking that could be triggering this disease. And I think that people who have systemic lupus are a little more susceptible to having um, certain medications trigger this. And then acute cutaneous is what we see uh, with the malar erythema uh, is most characteristic. Although you can see malar erythema with some of these other subtypes, um, it's really a hallmark also for acute cutaneous lupus, which is seen more frequently in patients who have systemic disease. You can also get photodistributed erythema. So just to show you some examples, so this is the kind of scale on erythema and dispigmentation, so the wider areas and also depressed areas that we see in, a, in, in discoid lupus. And so the treatments that we can offer usually are better for to trying to treat the red and the scale. By the time we get the dispigmentation, and there were some questions about this, you know, what can we do about hyper, you know, darker skin, lighter skin as a result of the activity? We're not so good at that right now. And so very often what we'll do is we'll recommend sunscreens, um, sun avoidance as ways to try, and to, try to uh, get, get some of these lighter or darker areas to clear up. But the main thing is to try to control the ones that are there, the lesions that are there, and to try to get rid of them with better therapies and get rid of them quicker. And so that we avoid getting more lesions and leading to more scarring. And then we have subacute cutaneous lupus here, which can look, as I told you, like ringworm, or it can look a little bit like psoriasis. And often the sun for all of these can be a trigger. So sun avoidance, sunscreens, and sunscreens have to be 70 or higher. The, the lower SPFs probably are not good enough. When you're photosensitive, you know, it turns out that SPF 30 is good for, for skin cancer prevention, but that 3% of light can be enough to really cause some problems um, when you're photosensitive from lupus. And this is more of acute cutaneous lupus where, you know, the sparing of the, what we call the nasolabial fold here, it's like, more like normal skin, but then you get the butterfly rash. And often discoid lupus can be in the ear, it can be on the scalp and leading to hair loss. Um, this is a very severe form of discoid lupus and probably, you know, it's something that we really 
um, need good treatments. This particular person had some treatment with oral steroids, which is not my favorite therapy um, because of the side effect profile and the fact that it doesn't really get rid of the disease. And so people really get as a transient medication, and then you have to find something else that's going to work. Um, but this is an example of the kinds of um, lesions that can happen in discoid lupus. It's also worth pointing out that 20% of people can have more than one subtype um, of lupus. And so some people can have, you know, both DLE and acute LE with a butterfly rash. Um, and that's not at all unusual. Also early on, it can be hard to tell what subtype the person has. So, you know, this could be either discoid lupus or subacute cutaneous lupus because the yes, subacute cutaneous lupus can lead to this, the lighter skin here or darker skin. Um, and it doesn't really tell you is it which subset it is. And so, Right now, there's some attempts to do trials in purely discoid lupus, and it's a little hard sometimes to tell early on what, what's going on. Now, we're talking about appearance today, and, and I know that from the poll that many people are very concerned about the effect of lupus on how they feel and, and, and how they look, and it's very clear why from the pictures I've shown you why this is a big concern. But it's really important to document with um, studies like this, where you can look at um, quality of life uh, based on uh, elements that are important uh, in terms of the skin. And what this is showing you is, is this is a skin deck score. So it's a way of looking at quality of life. And the higher the score, um, the worse the quality of life. And what this is saying is in blue, this is our people who have cutaneous lupus. Um, the score is high relative to other skin conditions and in particular high in patients uh, in the emotional realm. And that really fits with what people said, you know, just having your skin not look good has a big impact on how people feel. And so it's, that's one of the reasons we want to explain to, for instance, the FDA that we need drugs that are working because the skin is really important. And it's important also when you compare cutaneous lupus up here to other conditions such as heart failure, type two diabetes, even recent MI. It turns out that the patients with, uh, with cutaneous lupus have worse quality of life when you use something called the SF36, which is another way of measuring quality of life. And it has different domains. So here like social functioning, role emotional, mental health, all things that relate to how the skin is making people feel. It turns out the low score here means that the people are doing worse. And those with CLE have lower scores than people with pretty major medical conditions like type two diabetes or recent MI. And so th this is really important to re recognize again that you know it's not just about the skin, that it's compared to other medical disorders, this is really a problem. And we've looked at studies uh, in our population and that have looked at how much depression is there. Um, and we know, for instance, if we look over here at moderate severe uh, de uh, depression, that a very high percentage, almost 40% of people who have bad skin, lupus, have poor quality of life. And so that's, that's not very helpful. Now, how, what do we do about all of this? So one thing is to try to treat the, the disease itself. And so we use things like sun avoidance, sunscreens, uh, really good sunscreens. We talked about sun clothing, which have SPFs sometimes with that. And it's a lot easier sometimes to put on sun clothing to put on sunscreen on it and reapply it when you're in the water and so on. And then stopping the medications we talked about. And it's important to talk to your doctor if you have subacute cutaneous lupus about, you know, well, what are the medications that could be doing this? Then we have to uh, stop smoking. I mean, because smoking is, and I'll show you in a minute, is a really bad trigger. It makes people more likely to get cutaneous lupus, have worse disease and be more refractory to therapy. And so if you can stop smoking, it's gonna be a big help um, in terms of trying to deal with um, making your lupus a little easier to treat. There are some topicals that we use and that would be like topical steroids. And then they're like microlimus, tacrolimus. So these are all topicals. And there was a, in the chat a question about, um, there are also like JAK inhibitors that can be given, but they're not approved for cutaneous lupus. And so they're very, you know, hard to get the insurance companies to cover. And sometimes we use them for on a compounded basis to be able to use it for very localized disease. So this is just showing you about smoking. And here you can see people who are refractory where the therapies are not working are much more likely to be smokers. In this case, about 76% of people who were refractory were smokers. And, and it was much less than the people who were more responsive to therapy. So again, smoking is bad. 
So systemic treatments, um, we often will start with antimalarials for people who have you know, widespread disease. It's not responding to topicals. It's too widespread to put topicals. Um, and so we'll use hydroxychloroquine as kind of our first go-to drug. And, you know, we try to do it, for instance, if, it's, if you have disease in the scalp and you're worried about scarring, you know, this is a good thing to start early because it takes time to work. It can take a couple of uh, months. And then here you can see uh, we sometimes will switch to chloroquine, um, but that has more eye toxicity. So we kind of favor hydroxychloroquine for some people. And then occasionally we move on because this can work when hydroxychloroquine doesn't. We sometimes use compounded quinacrine, which is a little bit hard to get right now, but hopefully that will change. And that sometimes in com combination with either hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine can be really helpful when they don't, when people don't respond to just one of these alone. But you can't use hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine together because of additive eye toxicity. So immunosuppressives um, are things like methotrexate or mycophenolate are sort of the go-to drugs for people um, who don't respond to antimalarials or who have bad disease. And, um, and so these have their own set of side effects, and, and, uh, but they can be very effective and may need to be used for some period of time. But it would be nice to have some alternatives that work faster than hydroxychloroquine and potentially have less toxicity than things like methotrexate or mycophenolate. And they're people who do not respond to these. We have used thalidomide and now lenalidomide as a derivative of thalidomide, and that can be very helpful for some patients, but it has a lot of side effects, and it's not something we use except in pretty extreme situations. And then um, other things such as oral steroids, we pretty much uh, use as a bridge while we're trying to find another therapy that can work. Uh, sometimes we use Dapsone, which is anti-inflammatory, occasionally retinoids, which have kind of a lot of side effects and don't always work. Um, rituximab I pretty much don't use for patients who have cutaneous lupus because um, it can actually exacerbate the disease. So we don't necessarily, it can be used for nephritis and other parts of um, lupus, but probably not recommended for just skin. Belimumab has been approved for a while and it can help skin. Uh, it takes a while and it doesn't always work. And then enfrolimab, is, we'll talk a little bit about the data there. It's been approved for SLE, which is very exciting. And it seems to have really pretty good effects on skin. And I'll show you that. So the antimalarials use um, our work uh, in about 55% of patients uh, who um, take you know, hydroxychloroquine. So that's a lot of people that it doesn't work for and it takes a while to work and they do have some side effects. And so in the people who get the immunosuppressives like the methotrexate and mycophenolate, they maybe work about half the time. So there, there's still some holes in our treatment here. Now, I was also asked to talk a little bit about alopecia. And so I did want to just mention that this is a very confusing topic for people with lupus because there are many causes of alopecia and some of them are due to lupus, um, some of them are not. Um, and so there's lupus specific alopecias and I'll show you some examples of that where you can have discoid lupus, for instance, in the scalp and that'll cause hair loss, sometimes permanent. Um, you can have lupus nonspecific alopecia or you can have alopecia uh, in a lupus patient that's unrelated to lupus. And, um, and so they're, they're, that's why I'm telling you that alopecia is not all the same thing at all. But this is what um, sometimes can happen if you have discoid lupus in the scalp and you get the dispigmentation and the hyperpigmentation and you can lead, this is still pretty active and there's some erythema here, but it can lead to permanent scarring. And that's what we wanna to try to avoid. And that's why we need better therapies for pa some patients. Here you can see there's activity in some areas, but certainly it's scarred in other areas. And so this is, but we would consider this to be lupus specific alopecia. Now, I don't want you to think that everybody's gonna have this complication. I mean, it's not so common, um, but it's important to be aware that this is why we treat is to try to really get the activity under control and, uh, and prevent more spot, uh, areas from developing. Now, another thing we look for in lupus specific alopecia are these little follicular plugging black areas. And that can be a hallmark of something that we might see sometimes in discoid lupus. It can actually be there after the disease goes away. So it's not really a very good sign of activity, but in this case, you could see it pretty prominently. And then you can also get the um, hypopigmentation you can see here. There's some areas that are darker. Um, and then you can get some scarring with loss of skin markings and permanent loss of hair. So this really is a picture that shows you many of the attributes that can happen in lupus specific alopecia. 
Now, there are other types that we talked about cutaneous lupus. So this is subacute cutaneous lupus, where you can see erythema and hair loss here, same thing, erythema here, but the hair is growing back. And that's a good thing. And so in often acute LE or in subacute cutaneous lupus, the hair will grow back. And so you want to get the disease under control. So it has a chance to do that. Sometimes with discoid lupus, it's less likely to grow back. And then this is looking again at um, lupus specific alopecia. There's some redness here. There's some redness here and some uh, hair loss. And so one of the things we try to do is if we can get the lupus under control, then the hair will usually come back. Sometimes it won't come back all the way. Sometimes the medications can be a contrib con contributing cause for some hair loss. And sometimes when you have um, this type of hair loss, you can actually, what we call fast forward into more of a, what we call female pattern alopecia or a different type of hair loss. So if there's a family history of hair loss, all of a sudden you may find you have a more diffuse hair loss, which is not lupus, but it kind of is sort of a sequelae of having that. So what do we do to treat um, lupus-specific alopecia? Well, we treat with the same treatments as um, for other forms of skin lupus, really. So we went, already went through that with the antimalarials, with the topicals, um, and you know sometimes advancing to things like methotrexate or other therapies. But we also use topical steroid solutions, so liquids that will work better in the scalp where there's hair, um, also sometimes foams. Uh, there are actually shampoos that have steroids in them. And sometimes if it's a limited area, we might do injections of steroids and that can be helpful. Um, it's usually an adjunct. It's not going to be a, a sufficient alone, but it may help um, to decrease local inflammation. Then there's lupus nonspecific alopecia. And so this can be, you know, it's not necessarily lupus, but it can be due to several things like the hair breaking off in the front, which can happen. And it's called lupus hairs. Then the diffuse areas of non-scoring alopecia where you don't have red, you don't have scale, but the hair is kind of diffusely a little thin. And that's a very common problem in systemic lupus and something that people really are concerned about. But as you get the disease under control, typically the hair is going to grow back. And so that's why the focus should be on getting the lupus under control. And then there's alopecia areata, which is more of a patchy, often circular areas of hair loss. And that's really a lot different than these other things. And so this is often treated with uh, intralesional steroids um, and sometimes other treatments um, that we've already talked about can be used and, uh, for alopecia areata. And then there's lupus uh, nonspecific hair loss that we're talking about is, is pretty common in, in, in patients who have lupus. And again, self-limited and the hair regrows with the disease control. And that's really the main message here. So again, keeping the disease under control will help the hair. So there's this is more of an example of a lupus non-specific hair loss, just thinning in the front here. And lupus hairs, you can see sort of shorter hairs, but you can see even better here. The hair breaks off. Um, sometimes it's just you know more brittle. And sometimes the hair just falls out, it cycles more together. And so it looks like the hair is coming out all at the same time. And so the hair gets really thin. Um, and that's all part of the lupus being a little bit more active. And again, looking at sort of a, just the hair kind of thinning out, but this, if it's all due to lupus, it should grow back. And then you can also have like here discoid lupus, but also have alopecia areata in this kind of pattern in the same person. And that happens. So it's also important, I think, to evaluate what is the type of hair loss? What can I do about it? And then I really wanted to um, end a little bit more with talking about some of the newer treatments that are coming along. And what are the only ways we're going to get new treatments and or even one approved treatment for cutaneous lupus, which is still we're waiting for that first treatment, um, is to really do trials. And one of the some of the focus of the FDA right now is to make sure we have representation from you know really everybody. And so many of the studies right now are being done in in people who have light skin. But we know that people who have darker skin or Hispanics are more likely to have severe skin and systemic disease and making up about 43% of prevalent you know, cases. Um, but in the trials, and this is true for more, even the SLE trials, it's a much lower percent of the high risk people that are participating. And in order to get new drugs and make sure they work in everybody and to get new drugs approved, it's gonna require everybody coming together to, to try to um, get the better treatments uh, to market. So some of the new medicines that are targeting, uh, uh, for instance, the interferon pathway, which is something um, that anifrolumab does, it's actually got a, it blocks a receptor that has to do with how the interferons work. 
Um, and I'll show you some data there. But there are other ways of affecting the interference with drugs that have effect on cells that uh, contribute to interferon production. And that's all these other things that are all in, in uh, development. They're all trials going on. And in fact, anaphrolimab is going to also have a cutaneous lupus trial. And so these are all important things to think about. And we're going to need a lot of help in order to identify um, which ones are working the best. In the SLE patients, um, you can see here the grays and the placebo. And um, here you can see the two treatment arms. So this is our people who got the anaphrolimab. And this is looking at the percent response. So what you're seeing is a very quick response in the skin. And you're also seeing a lot of people responding relative to the placebo. And so that means this drug in this phase two trial was really quite successful. And this is the kind of improvement that was seen in a patient who had um, acute cutaneous lupus. And this drug is available, but only for SLE patients. And so we need to be able to get it available for patients um, who have skin lupus too. Now, this is a, a phase three drug. So this means it's a much bigger study and it's for registration of the drug. And so to make sure the FDA will want to um, approve it. And so here um, they're showing that um, there's twice as many responders um, in the treatment arm in red at, at 12 weeks, which was the endpoint for this particular outcome um, in the trial um, relative to the placebo treatment. And so this is working to, uh, really quite well. Over half the patients had uh, a response and the response is pretty stringent. It's a 50% reduction in an activity score. And we know this is important to patients that when this is, there's a 50% improvement, people are much happier. They're, they have better quality of life. So, and then in another study that was done looking at open label, meaning it's not a controlled trial, but this is um, use of anaphrolimab at week zero and then going week four, week eight. And here, what you're seeing is the, a rather rapid response in the, the activity score in the skin in many of these patients who had refractory disease. And, and then you can see by week four, many of them are trending down quite well. And then another approach would be, for instance, an antibody um, that it's, this is the lidofilumab, which is binding to a uh, BDCA2 and the receptor in the, on this cell that's involved with um, contributing to interferon production goes inside the cell and, and it causes the interference not to be made along with other um, proteins that are activating the immune system. So this was a study which showed that after one injection, um, you could go from having this pink interferon protein in the skin to not there at week four. And this was accompanied with a complete clearance of the skin lesions. So this is really good news. And it worked for quite a number of patients. It didn't work for everybody. Over here, the, the, the red interferon protein didn't go away and that person didn't get better. So we have a lot of work to figure out. And this is where studies will be helpful, who gets better and who doesn't. But in the phase two trial, what you can see is many patients um, improved relative to placebo, and it was pretty quick, again, coming down. So this is very exciting that we now have several drugs to talk about here. This is another, a third drug that um, very quickly you can see that, that the um, score in the higher dose group in red comes down, the skin score. And you're, again, you're seeing um, the, the protein, that uh, interferon protein here at, at baseline is gone in three months. And this, that's a, what you see when the skin is getting better. And the effects are very quick. So at one month, we're seeing really the red is, is the treatment group versus the placebo. And you can see you're starting to see differences between these two groups as time goes on. The red is getting better much more than the placebo. There's yet another drug. So this is a, such an exciting time, and but also such a tough time to develop these medications so that we can use them. But this drug has also effects on type one interference and other cytokines. And you can see here again, the skin score getting better. This is at week 48 uh, versus relative to placebo, huge response in the skin, really good news. Um, and there's now active uh, phase two uh, trials ongoing. So I think my time might be up, but what I wanna tell you is that skin lupus has a large impact on quality of life. Hair loss due to the lupus is a, is a problem for many people. Early diagnosis and treatment helps prevent worse damage to skin. We need um, more therapeutic options, and there are many new approaches to control the disease that are being studied. And so this is a really an important time for us to find better therapies. And I think with that, I will stop sharing. Thank you, Dr. Worth. That was great information. And it's so exciting to hear that there are new treatments um, in the pipeline and being researched. I know that there are people that could really benefit from those. Sure. I did see a couple of people 
um, comment in the chat asking about clinical trials. So I'm going to, to digress just a little bit off, um, off our plan because I want to share about an exciting opportunity that we have through the Lupus Foundation. Um, and I'll put the link in the chat um, when we get to the next speaker. But if you're not familiar, we have what we call Ray Research Accelerated by You, and that's our online registry platform. And by joining that registry, you can gain access to a world of, of research and engagement opportunities aimed at advancing these lupus drug developments. And like I said, I saw a lot of people really interested in the chat. So I just wanted to share this, but the participation in this is not a one-time effort. It opens doors to ongoing involvement and collaboration. And the, your experiences and feedback matter to us. I see a lot of people sharing their experiences with cutaneous lupus, alopecia, in the chat. And so this really provides you opportunities to share your thoughts and ideas in focus groups or listening sessions with industry and government entities who are responsible for making decisions about drugs that could potentially be made available to you. And nothing is more important than that lupus patient's perspective. And you can really work together um, to influence the decisions made by the FDA and pharmaceutical companies. And like I said, that's called Ray Research Accelerated by You. And I'll drop the link in the chat in just a few minutes. Thank you again, Dr. Worth. That was such great information. And we definitely need more people in clinical trials and we definitely need more diversity. We need more people with different skin tones and colors in those clinical trials as well. Okay, well, we will move on to our next speaker who is amazing as well. So next we have Dr. Shira Learman Zohar and Dr. Um, Learman Zohar is a licensed clinical psychologist specializing in rehabilitation psychology. She is an assistant professor at the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine and is the director of burn psychology services at the Johns Hopkins Adult Burn Center. Dr. Learman earned her PhD in rehabilitation neuropsychology in Israel, she completed a two-year clinical fellowship in rehabilitation psychology and a two-year research fellowship focusing on pain and sleep in medical conditions at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Dr. Learman has always been interested in the psychological aspects of health and illness and how people can overcome hardship and adversity. She strongly believes that we cannot fully heal the body without also addressing the mind and advocates for the importance of mental health services in medical settings. She has been a rehabilitation psychologist for almost 15 years and has worked with individuals with a variety of medical conditions with a special interest in conditions that involve chronic pain. Dr. Learman is passionate about helping patients alleviate their physical and emotional suffering through psychotherapy and mindfulness-based strategies. Through her clinical work, she assists patients in coping with trauma, anxiety, changes to their appearance and function, grief, and loss. She also specializes in teaching patients non-pharmacological pain management strategies to assist with acute and chronic pain in the treatment of sleep disorders, such as insomnia and nightmares. Through evidence-based interventions, combining cognitive, behavioral, and motivational approaches, she strives to help individuals during the rehabilitation process and assist them to better manage their medical condition and its effects on their lives. Dr. Learman's research focuses on factors contributing to adjustment to burn injuries and other chronic medical conditions, as well as understanding the complex relationship between pain and sleep in a variety of medical conditions, including rheumatic diseases. And today we'll have her talking about lupus and self-image. So thank you so much for being here. And again, we're so excited to hear your presentation. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited um, to speak about this topic. And I, I really thank the Lupus Foundation for inviting me. Um, this, this talk really, um, piggybacks on on the on the talk that was before me um talking about some of the emotional consequences of the changes to appearance that are triggered by lupus 
Um, next slide, please. So we're, we will, I have no, unfortunately, I have no disclosures. Um, and what we will talk about today, next slide, please. Um, we'll talk about the psychological consequences of lupus, um, define self and body image. We'll talk about how we can improve body image. And then we'll talk more in depth about self-compassion and self-acceptance. And if we have time, we'll even do a brief um, demonstration of some uh, a meditation to improve or to foster self-compassion. Um, so like we heard uh, earlier, lupus-related changes, there are multiple changes to appearance that um, are associated with lupus. And those can be hair loss, rashes, changes to pigmentation and even pigmentation, um, uh, scarring, and then weight loss and weight gain. Um, and then these, um, next, if you could click again, please. These are um, impacted by other factors that are very common in lupus including sleep disturbances, fatigue, pain, and then unpredictability of flares. So there are these interactions between some of the symptoms of lupus and then other factors that can make them worse and make it harder to cope with the changes that people experience. So we know that many chronic medical conditions, especially those that impact the way people look, can also change the way you see yourself. So not just the way you think others see you, but the way you start to perceive yourself. And when things happen, such as a medical condition that many times comes out out of the blue, it really shakes our sense of control over our life and specifically over our body. And it can, and it can cause these general feelings of not having control, of feeling helpless to cope with many different factors and so not just your health, but also in more in general, feeling lack of control over life. And many patients with lupus and with other chronic medical conditions talk about feeling guilt and shame related to their condition, even though there's no, there's no guilt or shame in having these types of conditions. But many patients talk about feeling really guilty or having shame showing other people that they're sick or talking about it. Many people spend time and a lot of energy covering up or not sharing that they have a chronic medical condition such as lupus. And when, when these symptoms happen or when, when people are diagnosed with a medical condition and people are diagnosed with lupus, there's a process of grief where you have to grieve losing a healthy part of yourself or having the life or the health that you thought you would always had. And the process of, of grief can be very similar to grieving the loss of a person. You can be grieving um, having, having lupus or not being as healthy as you were before. And these can also lead to having negative thoughts about your body. And many patients tell me feeling like their body betrayed them, like their body that they were so close with that they could trust. Now they feel like they maybe don't know it anymore. And that that feelings of betrayal from, from their body. And all these can impact not just how you see yourself, but also um, the feeling of, of body image or the or how we see or perceive our body. So when we talk about body image, what we're really talking about is the, the perceptions, the thoughts, and the feelings that one has about their body and their appearance. And it doesn't always have to do with exactly what you're seeing in the mirror. It's more of how you see yourself. And that can sometimes be very different from what other people see um, or from what the, the true, your true self is. Next slide, please. And um, this is a little bit of a busy slide, but what this shows is that a, um, a meta, a recent meta-analysis or in a systematic review of the literature on body image in lupus showed that there are a number of main um, 
uh, uh, main themes that come up in the body image and lupus research. One of them is depression and anxiety and how changes to body image are associated with depression and anxiety. So with emotional distress. Another main theme in research is how body image can reflect how people see their disease and how people see um, the severity of their condition. So through their body image, that's one of the ways they perceive their disease and its severity. And then there's um, a theme or a field of research that's really looking at interventions to improve body image through promoting acceptance of the changes that occur. So it's unfortunately we can't always um, we can't always change or reverse the the changes to appearance that happen, and it's really difficult many times to come to terms with the fact that these things might not be able to improve. Next slide, please. Next slide. Thank you. So research has shown that negative body image is associated with a number. Uh, go back with a number of negative outcomes. Um, so we see that people who report negative body image um, also uh, report poor health related outcomes. They report more social isolation and they are more vulnerable to experiencing depression and, and anxiety. And not surprisingly, negative body image is also associated with difficulties with sexual and intimacy and, and those intimate relationships that people have with their significant others. So as you can see, it's not just that um, if you don't like the way you look, then it's just confined to the way you see your body. It also has a very large impact on many other circles and many other aspects of one's life. But the good news is, is that body image can be changed. And even if you're experiencing very negative body image or very negative thoughts about the way you look, there are effective interventions that can help you feel better about the way you look and the way you appear. Next slide, please. Next slide. So there are a number of different interventions that can improve body image from more holistic approaches, to more formal uh, psychological interventions. And I'll talk a little bit about those now. Next slide, please. Um, so a psychological intervention that was designed specifically to improve um, body image in lupus, in systemic lupus, um, is called the Body Image Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, or BICBT. And the goal of this intervention is to modify dysfunctional thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. So similar to all cognitive behavioral interventions, that's CBT, we, we change how people feel about themselves or about, um, um, about different aspects in their life through changing the way they think about their body and through changing how they think, so how they, they think about their body and how they act in the world and the things that they do in order to change their feelings. Now, this is done through a number of different uh, interventions or a number of different parts to this intervention, including psychoeducation, so teaching patients about what it means to have lupus, what it means to have changes to appearance, what body images. Um, we talk about promoting self-monitoring, so checking in on how you feel, uh, what you're doing, what activities you do, cognitive restructuring, which is changing the way you think about things, uh, desensitization, uh, meaning um, make, many times people are um, afraid to do certain things. And by exposing them to doing things that make them anxious, we desensitize them to those uh, types of activities. Um, this intervention also includes two very uh, important other uh, parts. And one is specific education about lupus, about the stomach lupus, and about skin care, so different kinds of skin care, how to care for your skin in a way that will promote uh, better, um, that will promote better uh, appearance and better health. And then they also have uh, an appearance enhancement workshop, which um, is based on the look good, feel better uh, workshop that was designed by the Cancer Foundation, which really teaches patients how to 
uh, apply makeup, to use uh, wigs or hair extensions to really improve the way they look on the outside. So they, it, and it has been shown to have a very large impact on how you feel on the inside as well. And this intervention has shown to be, um, can, can you click one more please? Um, to be, uh, to improve body image, improve psychological well-being and quality of life in people with lupus. Next slide. So how do we, how do we help people self-accept or accept themselves? So one way is from the inside out. And, and that's through really processing the way you see yourself, the way, the way people see themselves, working on that grieving process of what was lost, if it's changes to the appearance or if it's other symptoms, things that have changed after, since you've had lupus and really work on that grieving process to achieve that acceptance. Um, there are many mindfulness and acceptance-based exercises, such as gratitude, journaling, um, uh, loving kindness meditations, to really help patients shift their perspective from more of a judgmental stance of constantly thinking about and judging yourself of how you look and that it's not, um, it's not what you want, to a more observing natural stance that can really help um, see yourself in a more accepting way. Next slide, please. And then we can also promote acceptance from the outside in. And I always tell patients, fake it till you make it. So even if you don't feel beautiful or pretty that morning, putting more effort sometimes into your appearance, changing out of pajamas, doing some things that you know make you feel a little better can actually improve the way you feel. So it's not being vain. It's not being... Uh, uh, focusing on trivial things if you want to look good. And many times patients tell me, well, but I have so many other health issues. How can I, so why it's not, it doesn't feel right to just focus on my appearance. That shouldn't be something important, but it is important. It's, it's a very important part of the way you see yourself and your quality of life to feel good about how you look. So doing things that make you feel good about yourself and for different people that can be different, um, different, different uh, activities or different uh, routines. Next, please. And like I said, when you look good, you feel better. Now, self-compassion, I've used that word a few times and it's something that we all, I think um, uh, many times is a challenge for us to feel compassion for ourselves as much as we allow us to feel for others. And I always tell patients to think about when they're when they're judging themselves or feeling bad about something that they did or the way they look or what's happening to them, to think about what they would tell a friend. If their best friend was coping with the same situation that they were coping, what would you tell them? And then allowing yourself to feel that same amount of compassion and kindness towards yourself. Um, so, uh, a really, uh, a really nice meditation that's helpful in fostering um, kindness and compassion towards yourself is called the loving kindness meditation. Um, and I don't think we have time um, to do it, uh, to do the full meditation, but um, just looking at these, at these phrases, and I'd like you all to think as I read them to just think about somebody that you that you love, that your love flows for them freely. It can be a family member, a friend, a pet, a spiritual being. And as I read these sentences, think about that person or that being. So may you be filled with loving kindness. May you be safe and protected. May you be healthy and strong. May you be free of suffering and pain. May you be happy and contented. May you live at ease. And now take just a deep breath. And I'd like us to say those sentences one more time, but this time directing all this compassion towards ourselves. And I'll read these one more time when I want you to think about yourself in mind. May I be filled with loving kindness. May I be safe and protected. May I be healthy and strong. 
May I be free of suffering and pain. May I be happy and contented. May I live at ease. And just allowing yourselves a few moments just to really resonate with those wishes of compassion towards yourselves, since you deserve it just as much as that person that you love does. And next slide, please. So something to think about and to remember, and this is also a process that many patients go through, is feeling that you and your disease are one or that the overlap is so great that it's hard to, to see where you end and lupus begins. And through process of acceptance and sometimes through therapy, we'll move there where lupus can be can still be beside you, but not but you will see where you are and where your lupus is. And it'll always be part of you, but it doesn't have to be the center of you. Next slide. So a few just a few take home messages I'd like you to to kind of have from this uh, very brief presentation is the body image is an important aspect of living with lupus. It's just as important as um, other parts, like taking medication, going to your doctor, um, other symptoms like pain and, and fatigue, all these things. Body image is a very important aspect of living with lupus and it can be improved. So if you're struggling with feeling like you don't, that the way you look and the way you feel about yourself is having an impact on your quality of life, this is something that can be uh, improved and treated. And caring about your appearance is not trivial. It's not a luxury. It's a big part of coping with this very complex condition that has a profound impact on life and how you feel about yourself and your appearance is an important part of that. And important, just allowing yourself as much compassion and kindness when you cope with lupus, which is a very big challenge. Um, giving yourself that kindness and giving yourself that compassion as you would to your best friend if they were dealing with a similar situation. You all deserve grace. You all deserve that compassion. And you're doing a wonderful job, even though sometimes it doesn't feel like that. And I want to thank you all. Um, and we all continue to grow and happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. We are now going to move to our Q&A portion where we can have our speakers come back to the screen. And I know Dr. Worth has been very, very busy along with our health educators answering those questions in our Q&A. Dr. Worth, are you, are you there? Are you able to join us yes. back? Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, okay, great. So a huge thank you to both of you um, and to Jamie as well for our, our special message and being a sponsor for tonight. Um, we have gotten a lot of great information. And um, if, if you still have any questions, feel free to submit that in that Q&A function. We'll, like I said, we'll try to get as many as we can. Um, I know they have been busy behind the scenes. If you did not get a question answered, please remember you can submit that to the health educators after tonight's program as well. Um, I've seen it asked a couple of times. So just a reminder, we will email out a recording of, the, of tonight's program as well. So we'll go ahead and get started and jump right into some questions. Um, and so I saw an interesting question come through the chat and Dr. Learman, it was while you were speaking and they said that everything you're talking about with anxiety and body image, self-confidence over hair loss and skin appearance, body image, et cetera, especially in young people is right on target. They wanted to know if there's any research to show why children of non-symptomatic parents might um, experience some of these effects or feelings of, you know, problems with self-image. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I think that uh, our children are very perceptive. Um, children in general are very perceptive and they 
they pick up on things, even if we try to hide them or we try not to talk about them specifically. And let's say if many times if they see their parents very focused on their appearance, then they'll they'll copy that, they'll imitate that, and they'll take their cues from them. Now, um, does it mean necessarily that if you have poor body image that your children will? No, it doesn't at all. Um, but a lot of uh, a lot of what children do is based on um, imitating, and that's how they learn, even if it's not through uh, specific teaching. Um, so I think that's a conversation to have. If you notice that that your children are having issues with body image, it's important to talk about it and to be open about maybe the struggles that you have with your body image. So it's something you can share and discuss openly because maybe they have concerns about um, how their parent is coping. And, and that's that's the way they're coping with it through talking about their concerns. Great. Yes. Thank you. Um, I also saw another question and I think Dr. Worth and Dr. Learman, I think you both might be able to answer this, but they, it wasn't necessarily image based, but they were talking about, you know, ways to adjust to life, um, life changes with new medications and those side effects. Do you have any tips or recommendations? Well, I mean, I think one thing is to make sure that you're know, noticing these side effects and reporting it to your doctors because, you know, there may be ways of modifying the medications or trying something different. And so, you know, you don't want to just, if it's really not working for you in terms of your of how you feel, then that may not be the right medicine for you. Uh, and the other thing would be to figure out, is there a way to do the timing of the medicine so that maybe it has fewer side effects if you're sleeping, if you take it. So there, that, but that requires a dialogue with your doctor. Right. And I also think that coping with a chronic medical condition, it's it's a full-time job that you have to do in addition to your other full-time jobs. And it can get overwhelming um, to, to manage symptoms, to figure out if the new medication is right for you. And it requires a lot of um, communication with your doctors to see maybe you can change the medications, but also remembering to take the medications on time and doing all these things that, that really are time consuming and, it, and are harder because of fatigue and other symptoms of the condition. So um, I think the adjustment to having a medical condition into the treatments can be very challenging. And if you are feeling overwhelmed, there are um, mental health providers that can help with that process to make it feel less overwhelming and give you strategies to cope better. Great, thank you. And Jamie, I don't wanna forget that you're here. Um, and so I just wanted to ask, do you have any, um, you know, I know we saw some people sharing about wanting to get more involved with some research or drugs being developed. Um, do you have any Anything you'd like to share with the participants about how they could get involved or any programs that AstraZeneca offers? So we have um, some ongoing trials in the lupus nephritis as well as um, cutaneous space. Um, right now, they're, you know, through clinicaltrials.gov um, is one of the ways you can find them. And Post this, I can I can probably pull them up and make it easier to find if um anyone's interested, then I can share that with LFA if you want to put it in the mo in the notes. Great. Thank you. Yes, I definitely saw people very interested in wanting to get involved with those clinical trials. I also saw this come up a great deal. I saw Dr. Worth, a lot of people asking about itching. Um, can you talk a bit about the correlation of itching with lupus and maybe some ways to relieve that, um, the itching that they're experiencing? Yeah, I mean, itching is a very common symptom in skin um, and there are many causes of it. So it, it probably almost requires knowing more about is the itch, you know, in the area of a skin lesion, is it more diffuse? Uh, and, you know, for, and I'll just give you an example of this. So people with lupus are more likely to have thyroid disease. Well, if you have thyroid disease, you're more likely to itch. And so, you know, and but maybe you won't have a rash in the area where it's itching. And so I think that there is a need to really, drill down on what else is going on. Uh, there can be, people can have autoimmune diseases that can affect the liver and cause problems with itch. And so, you know, it's, it's very hard to give one answer, but I think if it's related to the lupus, um, certainly people can, can, can have itching. And then usually if it's on the lesion, a topical steroid can be helpful. 
things like Sarna, which is a, like mentholated, you know, over the counter thing can be helpful. Sometimes people will take antihistamines and that can be helpful. Um, but you kind of, you know, like you can't assume that all causes of itch are from lupus. Lupus is just so difficult, right? And it might not be lupus. Right. I also, along with itching, I see a lot of fatigue talk coming up. That is something that people are mentioning that, you know, that's one of the biggest things that's a challenge for them with their lupus. Um, Dr. Learman, I know that, you know, sleep is one of of your areas. If if you maybe want to touch upon some coping mechanisms, related to fatigue and then Dr. Worth, if you want to chime in as well on the fatigue in relation to lupus. Sure. Yeah, so fatigue can definitely be related to having poor sleep, which is also common in lupus, but fatigue can also be one of the symptoms of the condition, even if you sleep, if your sleep is okay at night. And um, there are many ways to manage fatigue and it's it's, um, it's important to, to know that one of the things that are really important is to pace yourself is to do is to for is pacing. So before you become really, really tired and you can't do anything more, um, schedule breaks during the day so that you allow your body to recharge and don't get into a pattern where many patients will have a good day and then they'll be really, really, really active, but then they'll pay for it the next day because they were so active and the next day they can't do anything. So in order to um, to avoid those very uh, dramatic shifts in your ability to function, pacing yourself and being able to take breaks and allowing yourself to rest uh, throughout the day can really help with fatigue. Great advice, Dr. Worth. Yeah, I mean, it can, you know, fatigue can be part of lupus. I mean, it's a very common thing. And even people who you think, oh, I just have cutaneous lupus, they can still have fatigue. And I think that this ref- is reflected potentially with some of even the interference that can have effects and lead to fatigue. And so being able to treat the disease and block um, some of these inflammatory mediators may in the long run, and I don't th- know that we were formally shown this yet, but it could potentially help fatigue. And so I think these are all important aspects to think about, but not to realize it's kind of a mixed picture. So it could be from the lupus or it could be from the meds or it could just be the whole situational thing because life is pretty overwhelming when you have a chronic disease. So yeah, I think uh, those are those are sort of what I would say, but no easy answers for this one. Definitely. And this one might not have an easy answer as well, but is there a way to differentiate the difference between a cutaneous versus a systemic flare? Do those symptoms differ or are we just saying that that person's in a flare and we treat them as a whole person? Well, I mean, it, there's it, people who have systemic lupus uh, can have flares with their joints, with, you know, with their kidneys. I mean, there are a lot of different ways to have systemic flares. People with skin lupus similarly can have flares that affect the skin. And that would be manifested by more rashes or, you know, more more of the skin related issues. And there are people who, when they flare their skin, they're flaring also systemically. And so they kind of go hand in hand. So it, there's not a, as usual a one sentence answer here. <laughs> Very, very complicated topic, most definitely. Um, and and we find that with lupus, right? We know everybody is affected so differently. Um, I know we are getting close on time. Um, so I do want to make sure I get a couple more questions in. I saw a lot of people, again, there are, there are a lot of common themes that I saw throughout the questions tonight, but wigs. Um, do you have any recommendations about finding a place to get a wig? Um, Do you recommend wigs? Do wigs potentially irritate the scalp more? Um, Just more information about wigs in general. You know, I think there's so much anxiety and depression around hair loss that um, I think a lot of people, they just feel so much better with a wig because they don't have to worry about this. And I, I think that there's so many, uh, there's such an improvement in the design of wigs that very often you can't even tell that somebody's wearing one. And it's amazing um, that, you know, how, how different people can look with a wig. So it's hard to say that there's a reason not to use it one if you are really concerned about one's hair loss. And I have patients who really don't have much hair loss, but it's enough of a dramatic thing for them that they want to know about what the resources are. I don't know that I have one place that I recommend, but I would say there are a lot of places that they do an excellent job. 
you know, and, and uh, making wigs or hair pieces or, you know, there are a lot of different ways also to do hair replacement. Great. Thank you. I, I, I'm going to couple this. I'm going to ask my own question here. Um, if someone were to, let's say, get extensions to fill in some of hair loss, is there any concern for additional damage to the scalp or hair loss with those, with the weight put on the hair? Yeah, I mean, we worry about traction um, because um, we know, for instance, um, there very often that there's a hairstyle of poor and rolling that's very, very um, tight, and that can put a lot of pressure on the hair and then lead to actually a, what's called traction alopecia, which can be permanent. And so you do want to be careful not to have something that's going to be so, so, such a strain that it could cause problems. Yeah. Right. Here, again, I have a couple more hair loss questions. Um, and I think you might have touched on this briefly, and I'm sorry, Dr. Worth, a lot of these are for you this evening. Um, along with hair loss, do, is there any recommendation outside of treating the lupus itself, but to use any kind of over-the-counter medications or supplements for hair re regrowth or even any kind of prescription medications to regrow hair? So in general, I mean, I think uh, th because it's more of an inflammatory process, the things that we think about for people who have, you know, male pattern or female pattern alopecia, I think the treatments there are very, very different. And I don't know that they're going to work in a situation where there's inflammation in the scalp that's leading to the hair loss. So I would say, and I have quite a number of patients who, you know, where hair loss is such a problem. And there are some supplements now that people are taking for hair growth. And actually some of them have, um, have uh, stimulants in them, uh, immunostimulants that actually can be, is, are, are a little worrisome. Um, they have, uh, some of them have like ashwagandha in them, which can stimulate the immune system. And people with autoimmune disease, they, the thing that is really important to realize is that your immune system is already overactive. So anything that's, that you know that says immune stimulant or immune support is very concerning. And so I always read labels on all of the you know products that people want to, want to take. And I'm always surprised by the things that are in there, whether it be spirulina or elderberry, one has to be very, very careful. So yeah, so some of the hair loss over the counter things are a little bit, you have to read the labels. Definitely, that's good advice. That's good advice for, for anyone really taking any kind of supplement over the counter. Dr. Learman, I saw a question come through the chat just a few seconds ago, and I'm hoping I'm going to paraphrase this correctly, um, but they're asking how to lessen emotional reactions such as crying when you try to talk about issues, especially if it's related to a negative experience. Yeah, and, and we can feel very overwhelmed sometimes talking about negative experiences and, and crying on its own is not a bad thing. It's, it's the way of our, our body to, to release emotions. Um, but if it interferes with your ability to communicate with people, or if you're crying during times when you don't want to cry, then um, there's no, unfortunately, there's no one short fix for that. Um, but if there are things, for example, um, if you find yourself crying when people ask you about your lupus, for example, or if there's something specific that people ask you about, um, something that can be very helpful is to have a practiced response. Let's say when, when they ask you about your health or ask you about um, if, it's a, if it's a prominent rash, then you can have a practiced one-liner response of what you wanna tell people. So. So that something that you've already practiced, it doesn't have a lot of emotions tied into it. You don't have to think about it too much. And then you can give that response and not feel as emotionally overwhelmed. And you could have a few practice responses, like for somebody at the supermarket that doesn't know you very well, and another response for a friend that's not so close, and really write them down and practice them so that if when you're in these situations, you're able to not be as emotional and um, and feel better about that interaction. That's great advice. I really like having the having a prepared response for different types of people asking that question. Dr. Worth, um, I know that you touched upon this, but do you mind going back over, I still see some questions coming up about sunscreen. Um, can you go back over those recommendations of the SBF you recommend 
um, if it's if there's a different SPF for the face. And I also saw someone, I apologize, I'm combining here, but I saw someone mentioning that they have, they're allergic to sunscreens or sensitive skin. Do you have any recommendations for someone that struggles to find a sunscreen that works well without irritating their skin? Yeah, so, well, I will say we did write an article a few years ago. It's open access on International Journal of Women's uh, Dermatology um, that had to do with sunscreens and allergies. And so you may want to use that. It's open label. You can look at for my name. And I think it was Emily Keys was the first author to look at um, some of the recommendations, which, which sunscreens can be more allergenic and so on. Um, I think that uh, I would say in general on the face, um, 70 to 100 and on the skin, 70 to 100 in sun exposed areas is a really good thing. Um, some people are allergic to the chemicals and you can use like a mineral sunscreen, which is less likely maybe to have, have problems. Um, I think in general, there's a, also the ability if you really are allergic and you can't figure out which sunscreen to use, you, we can do patch testing to figure out the chemicals that you're allergic to and then pick the right the right um, sunscreen for you that is less likely to cause problems. But it's, it's not that simple. But the main thing is the message that keeps going out is that SPF 30 is good and it's great to be have SPF 30. I just don't think it's good enough for photosensitive lupus patients. And part of it is nobody puts on the sunscreens in the way that they're recommended I mean, the, the amount. And so it's not even being put on in a way that um, is an SPF 30, you know, and what's in cosmetics is more like a 15 and, and it's not put on in a way that is tested. So, so, you know, it's better to go with a higher, higher SPF where you have a better chance of block. Definitely. And don't forget to reapply that sunscreen too. Right. So it's hard to believe, but we're almost out of um, time for tonight's program. So as we close out, I would like to e ask each of you if you have one tip or a piece of information that you wish everyone takes away um, from your presentation. And Jamie, I'll open up to you if there's any kind of final message you'd like to share as well. Um, nothing really additional from me. Um, I'm just more curious, I guess, to all the the, pa the panelists and, and the folks listening in, um, if you've tried any dietary changes to help with your inflammation, if you saw any reduction in, in your itching as a result of that. Yeah, I mean, the diet issue comes up a lot and there are definitely patients who go on, you know, a hypo um, allergic type diet or low immune system diet and feel like it really helps. And so I often, I don't, I don't discourage that. I think if people can do it and they feel better, that's great. Um, but we just don't have enough data to be able to say, oh, this is the way to go. But I do know that a lot of alternative phys physicians or doctors or healers are using um, herbs that stimulate the immune system. And it's really, they're really concerning. I mean, there's certain, maybe lupus less than some other autoimmune diseases, but there's a strong association with flaring and so on. So be really careful. I mean, now, I mean, I'll just say that melatonin, for instance, now they're putting in ashwagandha and elderberry. You have to read the labels and then Robitussin even is elderberry in some of them. So you have to really look at what you're, what you're taking. And that would be one of the dietary things that I think if you take away, you know, anything about diet, you know, I, I, I think a healthy diet is super important. And, and if you can certainly try, you know, uh, a hypo, a low immune diet, a low inflammation diet, but in particular, don't do things that are going to stimulate the immune system. And people are trying to be healthy and it turns out that it's not so healthy. Great advice, especially in the day and age of social media, where we see so many people promoting certain diets and, and supplements. Um, Dr. Learman, any last final thoughts you'd like as a takeaway? Um, just that I, I'm so glad that um, to, to be included in this conversation about, um, you know, about changes to appearance and having that um, mental health, emotional component is, is very important. And if people do feel like they're struggling with coping and adjusting to their condition, there are um, there are ways to help feel better. Uh, and I hope that uh, people have access and it, it seems like the Lupus Foundation has such good resources uh, for that. And it's, it's really wonderful to see how everyone just looking at it from a mind body perspective and not just uh, the medications or the interventions, but really seeing the entire person. And I think that's key to health and to a good quality of life. 
mind body is so important. Thank you so much. And Dr. Worth, last but certainly not least, any final um, thoughts you'd like to share? Well, I mean, just really the hopeful thought that we, there's really, I think I shared with you some of the amazing uh, potential medications for the future that I think will make a difference. And I think we're in a very different time now. So even if you're finding it very frustrating with what you're doing right now, I think there's really going to be a, a revolutionary change in what's available in the future. Great. Thank you all so much. So um, we have the slides back up. And so I just wanted to share that here's more information on how you can reach out to us. And you can also follow us on social media, which is a great way to stay updated on all of our programs, events, and services that I've mentioned tonight. And then some, there's quite a few more that I wasn't able to mention due to time. We, um, like I said, we do have a host of other programs. Please, please, please check out our website, not just for those programs and services, but also the other information that we offer out there. Um, again, we do have our health education specialists available to help provide people with lupus, their families and caregivers with non-medical counseling, disease education and helpful resources. They've been behind the scenes along with our wonderful speakers answering your questions. Again, if you didn't get your questions answered tonight, I apologize, um, but you can feel free to reach out to our health educators at lupus.org slash health educator. Next slide. 